Many of you may not know about me, many things, and for that I'm thankful, but <laughs> one of the things you may not know about me that I, I grew up in the mountains in Idaho, and um, Idaho at one point uh, had more gold coming out of it than the Yukon did. We, uh, there's a lot, of, a lot of gold up there, and a lot of places that are still, you can still pull gold uh, out of those areas up there. My great uncle had a, had a gold, gold mine, two gold mines. Uh, we used to go down and super classic little, you know, like the, cold, the cart, like you see on Scooby-Doo and that kind of stuff, uh, the hats and everything. Um, we used to, my, my grandmother would, she grew up in the mountains and she would teach us how to pan for gold and the process it takes and, uh, and you know, we would be there beside her learning how to, to pan for gold. It's a lot of work, by the way, and you get like a speck or a flake, you know, uh, and you don't get much. And we, she was trying to fill up this like little, it was like a charm, but it, we, you could add gold into it. And uh, we were helping her fill that up because uh, we didn't care. We were kids. We were just, you know, it's fun to find it. We actually could find rubies too. We were more interested in the rubies because you know what? There's more of them than those little, it's all about quantity, right? So um, anyway, but in, in gold, there's a lot of processes in determining whether or not something is gold or not, because there's also this stuff there that's called fool's gold. I don't know, some of you are shaking your head like you know what I'm talking about. Um, but it's all over the place up there. And, uh, you know, as kids, you're like, wow, there's gold everywhere, you know, and, but it's not real gold. Uh, and there's actually a, a simple process, because you could find it in chunks as well. Um, and there's a simple process that you would take uh, either a black silica stone, which is called a, a touchstone, uh, or, or a bison horn. And uh, if you rubbed it on there and it left a gold streak, that was real gold. If it didn't leave anything, it was not real gold. And so it would become this, this touchstone test to determine the validity or purity of something. Um, now, and I would like to suggest to you that we go through a lot of touchstone moments uh, in our lives. And I'm not saying that God tests us, um, but we go through life, right? Um, this passage we just read said, In this you greatly rejoice, even though for a little while, is, if necessary, you have been distressed by various trials. That happens. You will be distressed. If you have not already, you will be distressed by various trials. That is a touchstone moment. How will you be measured? David went through a lot of touchstone moments, right? He didn't just like show up on the scene and start killing giants, right? You just don't do that. You go through some touchstone moments. He mentioned a couple whenever he was showing his resume, right? His resume, why he could fight this giant. He said, I fought the bear and I fought the lion. I've grabbed them by their beard. Those were touchstone moments. They came up, his gold was measured, and he killed the giant. And a lot of the things that we read about in people's lives, you go through the Bible over and over again. Noah built an ark. Yes, Lord. Touchstone moment, right? Abraham, I'm going to give you this great nation. Yes, Lord. Abraham. Sacrifice your son. Yes, Lord. Touchstone moments that we go through. Now, when you go through that moment, you have a choice, right? You have a choice. How is this going to turn out? If we look over in 1 Samuel uh, chapter 7, verse 12, there was this moment when Samuel needed to raise something that we sing about. We sing this song, although we think of a man in chains. Then Samuel took a stone and set it between Mizpah and Shen and named it Ebenezer, saying, Thus far... The Lord has helped us. So when you go through life and you have those touchstone moments, either it will be an Ebenezer that you look back on and say, God was with me, or it will be your end. But you've got to make a decision in that moment. We can look back and see those touchstone moments in our lives that are raised as a testament that God was there. God helped me. But you can only do that with a faith that can overcome. In 1 John chapter 5, verse 4, 
It says, For whatever is born of God overcomes the world, and this is a victory that overcomes the world, our faith. I saw a man hold his son. And hours later, say, I will trust in God. Touched on a moment. And it became an Ebenezer for that family. But how do you get there? How do you get there? When there are moments like that that people go through that would destroy us, how do you get there? Revelation chapter 2, verse 10, we, we, we say it a lot, right? Revelation chapter 2, verse 10, but we, like, we say the abbreviated version of, of that passage. The rest of it says, do not fear what you are about to suffer. Yes, Lord. <laughs> right? He's not really leaving us any wiggle room there, right? Do not fear what you might suffer. Do not fear what might possibly happen. Do not fear what you are about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to cast some of you into prison so that you will be tested and you will have tribulation for 10 days. Don't focus on the time. Be faithful, right? Be faithful unto death. Peter, the Lord has asked, or that Satan has asked to shift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you. When you return, strengthen your brother. We will go through many moments in our lives. Do not fear what you are about to suffer. Nothing is going to be laid on your plate that you cannot handle. And there are times when you're thinking, really, Lord? Really? This? Yes, Lord. Touchstone moment. We will perish. That happens. We are not promised to live forever. Uh, Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27 is that famous passage. And as much as it's appointed for men to die once, then after comes the judgment and taxes and such, right? Those are just things that, that happen. But we are given passage like 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7, casting all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. We're not left with this doom and gloom. We're not left with this concept that, well, we just live and we die and that's all there is. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 57, but thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our faith or through our Lord Jesus Christ. We've been promised victory. It hurts when we lose people. It hurts when we go through trials. It hurts when we go through those moments sometimes. But when have you ever grown? Whenever have you ever matured when it didn't hurt? Right? Growth sometimes hurts. Hebrews chapter 12 helps us. What do we do when we go through these touchstone moments? Look to Jesus. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us also lay aside every encumbrance and sin which so easily entangles us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. For the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. There is a joy that is set before us. He went there to prepare a place for you. I go to prepare a place for you. Insert, insert your name. Make it personal. He's there preparing a place for, has prepared a place for you. Look to Jesus who has gone there and done that for us. And I realize that sometimes it's hard for us to relate. We see, we see Jesus and we see the apostles and we see them as like these superhuman figures, but they wept, they hurt, they suffered like we did, do. But they leaned on God. David, when he 
wrote many of the Psalms, and some of the Psalms, we're not sure uh, who wrote them. Psalm 121 says, I look unto the hills, from whence cometh my help. My help comes from the Lord, who made heaven and earth. My God, who will sustain me, created everything. Which, by the way, was my first sermon. I was about four, according to my grandfather. Uh, and, and you know when something's going to happen with kids, right? You know something is about to happen. Get the camcorder. We're going to make $5,000 off this, right? <laughs> so apparently it was one of those moments. And, you know, everybody has a door they don't use. And thankfully that's the door the Jehovah's Witness knock on. Um, and that's where they leave their tracks. And I was on that, that stoop one day. And my grandfather and uncle had just stepped around the corner. And I had just picked up this track that was a Jesus track. I could tell because it had Jesus on it. That's all I knew, obviously, at four. And it got quiet, according to my, to my grandfather. And he said to my uncle, be, be quiet, something's about to happen. So my sermon in that, in my wisdom, was this. God made everything except this house. Because I had just seen my mom and dad make a house. So I know that God didn't build houses. People build houses. Which is Hebrews, by the way. It's, it's biblical, so... But we serve a God that made everything. That made everything. And again, it's a concept that we as finite individuals have a, have a hard time grasping because we're so confined to time and space and stuff, right? Like just the physical aspect. But we serve a God who is living and breathing and active and moving and created all things and sustains our faith, gives us every reason for belief. Psalm 120, I cried out to the Lord, and he listened. God cares for finite me when I cry out to him. In my touchstone moments, I can cry out to God and know where my help will come from. There are many of us who recently have gone through some of those moments. There are many of you who have a trail of Ebenezer's behind you. You've gone through those moments, and you wrap your arm around us in this moment. To say, trust in him, you will get through this. There's a lot of hurt right now in this congregation. A lot of people are hurting. I will tell you too, by the way, just FYI, that you guys like, are like a poultice for hurt. I don't know if you know, you know what a poultice is. Some of you guys know what a poultice is. It like draws out infection, draws out. I came in here Wednesday. It wasn't even 24 hours from the events that unfolded at camp. And I couldn't lift my eyes up. I couldn't sing because I would have been just this snotty, crying mess if I tried to. But, but being here helps when you hurt and you're around people that you know love you and you care for them. It's like this poultice that just kind of draws that hurt out. And, and I, I don't say that. I say it in a, in a very positive, it's a good thing. But it's just hard sometimes because it's like so fast, draws out so much. So when people are hurting and they come here and they have to step out, it's, because, it's a good thing. It's a good thing. When you say something and accidentally they start, they start crying, it's not a bad thing necessarily. It's just kind of some hurt leaving. But we need each other. God did not design us to be lone rangers by no stretch of the imagination. We need each other. Even Batman needed Robin, all right? So we need, we need each other. So what happens when our faith is tested? Realize that it is a time for us to grow. I called my dad and told him what was going on. And he 
said, son, find something good. I think I have. But it's hard sometimes, you know. And we have to do this together. We have to do this together. First uh, Timothy chapter four verse ten. For it is th- for this that we labor and strive, because we have fixed our hope on the living God, who is the Savior of all men, especially of believers. And that's where we fixed our hope. That's where we fixed our faith. That's where we look when we are going through those touchstone moments. We have victory, and everybody needs an anchor for that soul. We sing that song, right? Uh, In Hebrews chapter 6, verses 18 and 19, so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have taken refuge would have strong encouragement to take hold of the hope that is set before us. This hope we have as an anchor of the soul. A hope both sure and steadfast, and one which enters within the veil. And I am convinced it's tied right around the throne of God. We have a hope that is anchored within the veil. And a God that cares for us, has given us the victory, has given us each other. So that when times are hard, and your bucket is sloshed, so to speak, and things get turned over, We look to God, and we lean on each other, and we continue to fight that fight, and we continue to press forward, but together. Do not walk away from the very thing that would be an anchor and a help for you. And please, please, in these moments, raise them as a monument to say, thus far, God has been with us, and he will continue to be so. Tonight, you have an opportunity to raise your first Ebenezer. Put on Christ in baptism and say that I will follow God. I will be his child and he will be my savior. You have that opportunity tonight to make that decision. If you need the prayers of the church, or for whatever reason, please come forward as we stand and as we sing.